Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Duke Oishi. And I'm Donna Blanchard. In our show this time, we'll show you the process behind mounting a Lee Cataluna play at a local theater. We'll go to Kumukuhua Theater on Merchant Street and hear about it from the artists themselves. We got an insider's view of not only the inner machinations of the theater itself, but we also learned about how this work affects everyone involved. We can see how the company at Kumukuhua Theater practices theater of place. They encourage and support local playwrights and produce local works using actors, directors, and designers right here in Hawaii. The work of Lee Cataluna is a prime example of theater that speaks about and to people of Hawaii. It's a play about a family, and it doesn't shy away from showing us the good, bad, not so pretty, and beautiful array of familial personalities and relationships. All of Lee Cataluna's work is very local, but it's also as universal as family itself. She is an enormously talented playwright who manages to bring us poignant drama wrapped up in touching comedy. If we do this right, it can serve as a model for other communities. The artists involved in Lee Cataluna's plays and all the plays at Kumukuha Theater learn about themselves and their community as they work on these shows. Then the audience is brought in to complete the artistic circle. That's part of the beauty of Theater of Place. Over the last two weeks, I had the privilege of interviewing three actors involved in the show and the director. From them, we heard four very different perspectives on how the work behind a play like this is completed. Then we went to Kumukuhua Theater for a tour and behind-the-scenes view most people don't get to see. But we happened to have an inside connection to this very special theater. So we were given an all-access pass. I'm not only the host of Center Stage, a talk show on ThinkTech, I'm also the managing director of Kumukuhua Theater. All of us at the theater, we're really happy to share the process behind our work with ThinkTech. The show, Flowers of Hawaii, was originally produced at Kumukuhua last November and December. It then traveled to the Maui Arts and Culture Center in February of this year and is now being remounted for Oahu audiences. Let's start off by hearing from Reb Allen and Jason Quinn. These two are actors who have been a part of the show from the very beginning. When you first start out, it's like, I want the lead. You know what I mean? Like, that, that's what you want. You know, that, every, every actor wants that. I want the lead. You know, and then as you, as you get further, like in what we were talking about earlier, when you start doing it for the love and for the, you know, and where you start seeing what the whole process of storytelling is, you start seeing, well, how, how am I helping this along? You know, and where, where do I fit in better? Or what's the best place I can fit in to tell this story? And um, then I'll take a look at it and I'll, I'll go, okay, I think, that I, can, I think that I can do this. I think that I can serve this piece. Um, how, how does my experiences coalesce with the experiences of this character? What, what, am, what have I gone through already that is, that is real to what this person's going through? And if I'm playing a character that's very far from me, very far from my normal everyday, how I act and stuff like we were talking about closer. Like that was, that was so far from me that, you know, the, the character is very cowardly, the character is very sh shrinky and, and, and small and, and I had to, and he just did some really gutless things that I thought were very gutless and made me sort of feel bad inside. You know, I was just like, and then, but I have to, I have to go there and I have to try to make that make sense. When I'm playing a character like that, it's just I can't wait to stop rationalizing it. You know what I mean? I can't wait to get back into my, my identity and say, no, that dude is a coward. Or, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I don't like that guy. I don't like that, you know? Yeah. And, and, but when, you, when I'm in it, I have, to, I have to constantly rationalize everything he's doing and why he's doing it so that it's good, it's right, it's just and he's, he's the good guy. That's sort of my process, sort of uh, a, general, a generalized sort of sweep of my process. My new process, because my old process, since I used to do uh, HTY and that was, I was getting paid for that, was when I would do community theater, it was what pretty girl was gonna be in the cast. <laughs> that was my old process. My new process, as I've developed <laughs> as an artist, is uh, starts with the script, I always because you, <laughs> you got a girlfriend. That's, <laughs> I have a girlfriend. No. no, it starts with the script. Um, yeah, I want to read a script and I want to close it. I want to literally, when I close it, I want to just be like, wow, or you know, just have that emotional response to it. That there's something there that just make me, yeah, it took my breath away. Something. Um, and if it's not that, I want to read it and go, dang, this dialogue is awesome. Like I want to say this. You know, I love it when a playwright really knows how to write good dialogue. Um, it's like my favorite thing as an actor. But then once I get the script, um, the process from there 
is uh, I've been blessed that I get a lot of uh, amazing actors, especially at Kumu. Kumu draws in all the really talented people in town yeah. that are good mm -hmm. in there. So, um, so it just makes your job so much easier as an actor to just listen and respond to the person with you. But I go through this whole breakdown of the script. I try to think of the script from an audience member's point of view, from a director's point of view, from the playwright's point of view, and then from what I read on my initial reading, um, I write down things I hate, things I love. My style is, yeah, I will go into rehearsal and I will have my intentions in my head, I'll have all my homework done, and yet I'll just be free to throw crap at the wall and see what sticks sometimes. Yeah, yeah I want to do so much work during rehearsals and not be set on something. Yeah. And Because I trust my director. I trust yeah. my director to help guide me along that way too. Um, but I also have to give them something that's going to inspire them to do that. So I'm always looking to give my director something. Every night, we're, I'm, I'm trying to entertain that guy. Because I figure yeah. if the director's bored, my audience is going to be bored. But yeah, because once showtime comes, I want to just, set be, I want to have everything let go and I want to have done all my work so well and so hard and get it so locked in that showtime I can just forget about it. It's there in my subconscious and I can just listen, respond and play. These two are obviously good friends and very alike, so it was surprising to learn that their processes of interpreting a character to prepare for a show are very different. Next, Jordan Savusa and Harry Wong came to the Think Tech studios for a conversation. Jordan replaced another actor who was unable to do the remount, and Harry is not only the director of the show, he's also the artistic director of the theater. And something of a theater legend in Hawaii, his work is really marvelous and consistently pushes boundaries. You came into a cast who, for the most part, not only uh, had this cast done a full run of the production, we, we did a full run of the production and sold out every seat and did an extra weekend, so they had a really long run together. And then they all went to Maui together for a weekend yeah. and did the show there. This is a really um, wonderfully tight group of people. Mm -hmm. uh, they are like a family. They are a family in the show. Um, so you have that dynamic to work your way into, and uh, just the camaraderie and the fact that they have a tight little show that oh, yeah. you're doing that you're coming into. How's that process? I came in knowing nothing. I did not see the show. I was away, and I'd never heard of the play. Just knew that it was a Lee Cataluna play. So that was making me excited just to be a part of it. But uh, when I showed up, everyone was super cool. Uh, and I just slowly just learned how to do the show, the transitions, the scenes, remembering lines. Uh. You know, I mean, one of the good things about having a new actor come in is that um, you get to see a fresh pair of eyes, you know, going to the scene. Mm. And I think, um, like yesterday, we had a run through. And I believe for like a lot of the actors, uh, not having an audience there you know, like affects them because in there it almost feels like they're waiting for laughs or they're waiting for the focus that a that the audience would give them because yeah. they're used to it. Whereas in the scenes that Jordan was in, they had to come at it fresh again. And so then I think right. like tonight I'm gonna talk to the, the actors and I'm gonna say, Hey, you know, like come back to when we first started working on it, you know, like how you guys focused on listening to each other and playing those moments. But all of that was there because Jordan is new to the process. And then really um, this, uh, I think, I hope Will Kahele won't mind that I, uh, that I say this, but uh, when Lee wrote the piece, she tried to not write it in pigeon. And then uh, really the only pigeon that's there is because of the actor's inflections. It's really interesting, I think, even for Lee to hear it, hear it done the way that, that uh, she may have intended it. Oh. And then it also forces the actors that are with him to to speak in a different way to each other. Yeah, it get, it probably sort of galvanizes everyone to have something, have it shaken up like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then and then Jordan Jordan is funny. He did uh, he did both scenes just completely hilarious. You know, like that. I mean, I was crying the entire time. I knew what I was getting into. A lot of you know professional actors you know who have done the show already, and I have to say my experience has been great. I I feel like it's growing. Uh, my process as an actor is growing by just being around these very talented people in a very talented theater doing very talented things. I'm, it just all feels great. Uh, oh. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of some hard. things are hard yeah. and uncomfortable, but at least I know with you know the cast 
and the uh, stage hands and the director and uh, everyone has been really supportive and I can't I couldn't have asked for a better experience with Kumukuhua. You're playing a character quite a bit older than you are yes. in real life. Yes. Yes. How's how's it been working through that? Working with that? It's it's uh, a whole new get ball game. I I've, I've done it before, I know. Yeah, I well the person I'm playing is 50 in his 50s, I think in his 50s. Thank you. I shouldn't read the script. Uh, so he's in his 50s, and I'm, I'm 29. And then we got our tour of the theater. It's not as glamorous as you might think, but in all theater, the transformation from rehearsal to opening night is definitely magical. Hi, welcome. We're in the bowels of Kumukuhua Theater, downtown Honolulu, very near Pioneer Plaza, the corner of Merchant and Bethel. This is the office that three of us actually work in at Kumukuhua Theater, um, but it is also a place where everyone else involved here comes and brings things and finds things and keeps things and throws things and leaves things. The show that we are um, working on, opening on Thursday, is called The Flowers of Hawaii. It was written by Lee Cataluna. This is actually a remount of the production. This is a production that we did last uh, f uh, no November and December. It's a show about Hawaii. It's a show about family. It's a show about people. It's one of the most moving plays that we had in that it captures our humanity in such a relatable way. You laugh and you cry and you cringe, but most of all you smile. This is the back room at Kumukuhoi Theater, and it is, it is our shop, it's our tool room, it's our lumber room. If you um, take a look around in here, you'll see something that's kind of magical. If you see, come and see shows at Kumukuhoi Theater, you'd find it almost impossible to believe that everything you see built out there in the theater is probably in here. Our theater is very unique in that we treat it, we treat it as a true black box theater. It changes for every production that we do. It's a very intimate, 100 seat theater, and when you are acting in it, you are very aware your audience is right there. And when you're part of the audience, you are very aware that you are, you are sharing the same air with these actors. You are a part of the experience that is happening. Will is the actor who was replaced in the show by Jordan. Um, uh, was he good enough? Because he was, he was unable to be here, but what I think is really interesting, Will is also the office manager and the box office manager here at the theater, so he's very intimately involved in everything that we do. And I'm just wondering, I asked you a little bit earlier today if you were going to see the show. How do you feel about, because this is such a tight-knit family, how do you feel about seeing a show with someone else playing that role? Uh, it was, I, I watched it last night. Yeah. So it was very surreal. It was like an out-of-body experience of just having somebody else in that part. But it was <clears throat> kind of good because uh, he... Uh, uh, kind of uh, screwed up on the same lines that I did. So. Oh. <laughs> what? So, so it was, yay! It's not me, it's Lee! We've had a really wonderful partnership with uh, Joe Dodd, a professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He has used his students to design each of our sets. Uh, this set was designed by Troy Apostle in that, in that class. Um, and we take them, sometimes the students work with us also, but we take those designs and then we make them happen here. And then Joe gives them a grade on the design. Mm -hmm. So this is a Troy Apostle design that Kimo is reassembling for this show. And then we got to see a little bit of one of the scenes from the show. This is Will Kahele and Danielle Zalapani. Will is the actor who was unable to do the remount, but he was happy to step in and give us a little taste of the show. Holy crap! No, you get a lot of nerve coming into my house trying to boss me around about everything I say. I think he's using language like that. Ah, I tell you. You're running for county council. Considering I haven't decided. Well, retirement from the state not good enough for you? Look, if you serve four years, you get a second venture plus medical. Ah, I just think you long term, Chloe. I don't want to be a burden on my kids. So you're trying for the Filipino votes. They already think I am anyways. Look at me. I'm brown, I'm handsome, my name is Orlando, I jump at sports, but I coach anyways. I take care of my car. I had my first kid when I was 15, and my last kid when I was 52. <laughs> I'm Filipino in every way but one. But that's the only one that matters. What's in here? 
and you give. That's what matters. <gasps> you cannot pretend to be something you're not just to get people to fall for oh, you. Oh, that's how they do it. Oh, Filipinos? Politicians. Wait, so what's tonight? There no ball. The pageant thing? It's for the Visayan book. You're a member. I've been invited to join. The Visayan Club does not discriminate. Well, I hope you don't expect me to campaign for you at the college. I don't even want you to vote for me. If you was the boss of the world, you'd have everybody that is one race stand over here, and everybody that is another race stand over here, and no talking, and don't say anything that could be offensive. Just keep to yourself. To me, that's offensive. That's not how Hawaii is. That's not how the world is supposed to be. Kumukahua is a community theater. That means that almost everyone involved in these productions is a volunteer. Though it's the only theater strictly devoted to theater of place, there are lots more community theaters on the island. That's true, Duke. We are really lucky. You could see at least one new show almost every weekend of the year right here in Honolulu. And remember, every one of those shows has a playwright, director, designers, technicians, and actors, all with their own motivations and processes driving their work. There's a rich tapestry of entertainment, enlightenment, community, and humanity, and an industry of great work and rich careers waiting for us behind the curtain. A good way to learn about upcoming shows, auditions, volunteer opportunities, and all sorts of local theater news is to visit the website hittingthestage.com. It's an independent website devoted to reporting and reviewing theater in Honolulu. So, whether you knew it or not, there are great plays and great evenings out to the theater available in Honolulu. More than that, there are great opportunities for anyone interested in the roar of the grease paint and the smell of the crowd to participate in local theater, either on the stage or backstage. Either one is a totally creative and fun experience with huge personal and poetic benefits. Do you have a penchant for play production? Do you have a wish to reveal and express yourself on the stage? Go to a play today. Find yourself at Kumukuhua Theater and see what we mean. And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts video and audio for all of our talk shows live on the internet from 1 to 5 p.m. every weekday afternoon. If you missed a show or want to replay or share any show, they're all archived on YouTube. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our live stream and YouTube links or to join our email list and get these links and advisories on our upcoming shows. We also invite you to be a part of our live audience at our downtown studio in Pioneer Plaza. Contact J at thinktechhawaii.com. Raise your awareness in every way on ThinkTech. <laughs>
On Thursday, August 7th, ThinkTech will present a luncheon program featuring remarks by our new UH president, David Lassner, on his vision for the university. This program will be at the Lania Kea YWCA. You can sign up to attend at thinktechhawaii.com. And now, here's this week's ThinkTech commentary. I'm Jay Fidel with a commentary on the danger of amnesia. We need to remember, because as George Santayana said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. The benefit of modern civilization and all our miraculous technology is that it theoretically helps us remember and thus avoid reliving the past. But we seem to forget everything. We are quickly forgetting the lessons not only of World War II, but also those of Korea, Vietnam, and for that matter, Gulf I and Gulf II. Young people have no idea. Older people also forget. Or they accept misinformation even when they should know better. That's probably worse than forgetting. Not only don't we know the truth, but we choose to remember only the falsehood. While we forget the atrocities of before, the world is turning cruel again. There is so much violence, even our outrage is forgotten. We used to say, never again, in an oath not to let these atrocities repeat. But if we have forgotten what we are not supposed to have ever again, that oath is meaningless. The likelihood is that we will have it again, whatever it is, even if it was really bad. In short, we haven't learned. It's like the winds of war. Great winds sweep over the world, pointing toward huge irresponsibility and ultimately conflagration. Kindness and caring, respect and tolerance are lost. Everyone for himself, where inhumanity is more in fashion. Use human shields, blow yourself up, and take with you as many others as you can. Terrorism. Torture, maim, and destroy your own people. Deny them any possibility of a normal life or education. The ends justify the means. It's the clash and the decompensation of our world while we watch it from the sidelines. Through amnesia, the best of times become the worst of times. In fact, however, there are no sidelines. Who will lead us to higher ground? The schools don't teach these things. The parents have forgotten. The reaches of our memory seem shorter. We are not only forgetful, we are tired of remembering. We don't want to hear about the bad old days again. We rely on thoughtless rationalization to be freed from the lessons of the past. Victory at sea is over. It was 70 years ago. No one thinks about it anymore. The Nazis are frozen stereotypes in old war movies, anti-heroes who have somehow lost their evil. Now the skinheads are back and the synagogues are being attacked in Europe and even in this country. We have forgotten and we are no longer afraid of repetition. Rather, we seem desperately afraid of doing something to head off the repetition. The world needs to remember the fear of yesteryear to avoid what caused it in the first place. We see so many examples of inhumanity these days, but we do so little to quell it. We let it go, like Chamberlain did. Remember him? The Jews remember. They remember the war and the Nazis and the methodical genocide. They remember being the object of unbelievable multi-generational hatred then and in the Middle East now, where people they hardly know have sworn to destroy them, to kill them every one, to push them into the sea, to make them disappear from the earth. Yes, even now, even today. No, they cannot afford to forget. Forgetting is the greatest risk of all. They must defend themselves. They must preserve their lives, families, homes, their society. They must survive. They must say, never again. It's as simple as that. But actually, this is not limited to the Jews. We must all remember so we don't have to relive an outrageous past. There's nothing in the human spirit, collectively or individually, that guarantees civil society or moral progress. We could fall back into the pit of hell, the state of nature, any time. We, all of us who know this truth, need to work hard to avoid repetition of deception or evil. These are scary times, increasingly polarized, where the common good does get lost and no one seems to come to its aid. It's not about social justice or dissent or activist causes. It's about personal decency and moral courage, kindness, tolerance, every day. It's time for a fair appraisal of how long it's been since the Holocaust and how much we have forgotten and how dangerous it is 
to be without a moral compass. All this seems even more important these days when the shadow of overpopulation and undersupply undermines our future and confuses our perception. When shortages in food and water and the prospect of great biblical floods and climate changes threaten our quality of life, our peace, and our community, and also our species. We can and should expect these forerunners of apocalypse. It would be bad enough were we fresh out of the war when we could remember the lessons of hardship, but it will be much worse in a world that has forgotten. Do you remember? Have you learned? Or are you just another victim of amnesia? Silence is not an option. I'm Jay Fidel with this Think Tech commentary. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Donna, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Jay Fidel does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. Definitely do. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Yes, be a guest or volunteer, a producer or intern, and help us reach Hawaii. I'm Duke Oishi. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech and for supporting tech, energy, diversification, and globalism in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. Aloha, everyone. I'm Donna Blanchard. See you next time.